Apple presents events at the Apple Store. We're here to celebrate The Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies! But before we get started, why don't we take another taste of the trailer? Thorin, you gave a promise. You brought upon them only ruin and death. You've won the mountain, is that not enough? Now, we defend it. I came to reclaim something of mine. This was the last move in a master plan. A plan long in the making. These bats are bred for one purpose. For war. Leave Sauron to me. Bilbo is right. You cannot see what you have become. Everything I did, I did for them. You started this. You will forgive me if I finish it. When faced with death, what can anyone do? will not hide while others fight our battles for us! You have but one question to answer. How shall this day end? How awesome does that look? That's amazing. Okay, we've got our two guests. They're going to bring them out now. First, the Elven King, Thranduil. Let's welcome Lee Pace. And our, and our other guest, the king under the mountain, Thorn Oakenshield, is here. Richard Armitage. <laughs> so something I've always wanted to ask actors that, um, that appear in these movies, these massive epic Peter Jackson movies, when you get a role like this, like what's the first thing you do? Do you flip out? Do you do you, do you read? Did you read The Hobbit? Did you had you already read The Hobbit? Yeah, the first thing I did was read the book again. <laughs> yeah, because I'd read it when I was a kid. But then um, I guess I read it when I was preparing to you know meet them and audition for it the first time. Um, Watch Lord of the Rings again. Watch the extended edition. Watch the, you know, all the other stuff. Because it's all, it's not just about the Hobbit. It's about this whole world that Peter Jackson has created. This Middle Earth, which is uniquely him, you know, in many ways. And, and the idea of him making a second trilogy with this Hobbit trilogy, there must have been some pressure to make it as, as good as the first one. Is that it going through your head? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when the first trilogy was being made, I'd gone to my agent and said, please can I, please can I audition for this? And he said, well, what would you audition for? And I was really interested in playing Legolas. <laughs> and yeah, that was his response. He laughed me out of the room. So I was really disappointed, you know, that it, it, I was very late to the table. So to get the chance to come and, and be in this, you know, revisit to Middle Earth was, was a bit of a, a legacy, a bit of a dream come true for me. Um, both of your characters in this final installment, they, they undergo some pretty profound emotional changes. It's almost like, like 
you, you, you seal the story away a little bit from, from Bilbo. And, uh, and I wanted to talk to you, to you both about that. Uh, well, why, don't we start, why don't we start with you, Richard, with, with, uh, with Thorin. Uh, again, not to spoil anything for anyone, but Thorin becomes obsessed a little with greed. How, do, how, did, how does Peter help you with the emotional arc, like something like that? I mean, it was, it's sort of built into their screenplay, and it's, it's there from the very first prologue of the first movie that there is this susceptibility to dragon sickness that he witnesses his grandfather going through. So as he's approaching the mountain on this very linear quest, it's always looming in the distance. So you can feel the black clouds of, of that kind of insanity gathering and then you you see him descend into into his own mind and into the mountain in in the third film so you know the guidance came from peter and fran and philippa and just gauging you know how mad we make him how quickly was something that uh, changed throughout the course of filming thorne's really strong but I, I feel like in this film especially we get to see uh, the vulnerable side of the character it's something that i mean are there things about thorne that we don't really know yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that uh, we kind of looked at together as uh, as actor and filmmaker is making the current character as inconsistent as, as possible. You, normally, you look for consistency in character. So we tried to make him um, su surprising and un unexpected. And, and part of that was giving him a vulnerability. But of course, you know, as he approaches the end of his story, let's call it, um, where he the only thing he can do is speak the truth um, you know, that's the ultim ultimate opening up, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I feel like we should, we should play a clip. Do we, have a, do we have a nice clip on that? It's not that scene, is it? Uh, I don't, Please tell I don't me it's think not so. that scene. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but there is a nice clip. What do you think I'm trying to do? I think you're trying to save your dwarvish friends. And I admire your loyalty to them. But it does not dissuade me from my course. You started this, Mithrandir. You will forgive me if I finish it. Are the archers in position? Yes, my lord. Give the order. If anything moves on that mountain, kill it. The dwarves are out of time. Is that a, is that a wig you're wearing? In that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's your real hair, right? Yeah. Actually, it's a good enough transition. Let's talk about that, Lee. I feel like, I feel like your character also goes through some deep emotional changes, especially regarding battlefield sacrifice and the, some of the finer points of love. Um, is that the... Well, I mean, the, uh, the character as written in the book is, I mean, he's never called Thranduil. It's, um, you understand, you know, a few of the actions that he makes throughout the, uh, the book and are in the movie. But this movie was never based on the book that was published in 1937. It's based on everything that Tolkien then learned about Middle Earth, about the elves, about these characters, as he wrote Lord of the Rings and the appendixes, and you know, well into, um, you know, he, he developed this world over many, many years. So that's that's the story that you know they're telling, we're telling now, um, and we've learned so much about Thranduil in that time, and that's we try to put all that into this story and add, you know, a little, you know, a bit of our own creativity to it as well, you know, um, and I and I and I and I, you know, when. He's an isolationist. He's tough. He's very old and grumpy. <laughs> he doesn't want to get involved in a fight. Um, but um, when the dragon dies, which is not a spoiler because, I mean... These people know that. Come on. <laughs> um, all eyes are on that mountain and what's going to happen, you know, with this immense treasure that is, you know, uh, lying vulnerable there and... Um, and what's going to happen next? And it feels like the machinery of war is coming into place and no one can stop it, you know? So, yeah. That's I mean, a painful thing. Oh, I can imagine. And it's... When, when you're working on a, on a project like this or any of the, these three Hobbit movies, I imagine a lot of the acting is to special effects that haven't been created yet. Um, but one of the great things about this trilogy is just how how there's such a, a wonderful emotional through line through all of them. And I think that really does come from the acting and the actors. I'm wondering just if you could give us some insight on set, how, how Peter foregrounds the, the emotion and the acting, like your through lines. You know, it's one of the things that I've loved about working with Peter is that he's as interested in actors as he is with technology. And he says himself that he never, 
he doesn't lie in bed dreaming up new ways to kind of create visual effects. It's always driven by the action and, and the actors. And um, people always ask you, is it really difficult acting on a green screen? The reality is that you're the only living, breathing thing in that green box, so you get all of his attention. And for the time that you work with him, which is actually relatively short compared to the post-production period, you get so much of Pete, you get his heart and his soul in the writing and you know, face to face. And he's a great actor, so he, he, you see little bits of your character reflected back at you, which I really enjoyed. I mean, it's an act of imagination and it always was, whether it was a set that's built or you know, if you deliver the performance and then the set is built after the fact. I mean, it's all part of the, the imagination. When we had our first scene together in Desolation of Smog, we were in different rooms. Because there was, like, the, he had built this incredible thing where we could, for the size difference, we could act at the same time and listen to each other, but on completely different sets. And I still felt like there was, you know, the reality Thank of the moment God. there. Thank <laughs> God. Richard, I've heard you describe yourself as um, an actor that really immerses yourself into the role and even a, close to method acting, and I wonder how that applies on something like this. I, I've never described myself oh, like that. I immerse myself I into know, a I bath at the end of the day, but that's about it. Um, I think everybody does in different ways. I just, um, with this particular role, playing one character over three movies, it was two at the time, but whatever, it's a long period of time, um, in a very kind of heavy, hot, uncomfortable costume. I, for me, it was about concentration and just not letting that be a crippling factor. So when you see me in between takes facing the wall in a corner, because I don't want to be disturbed, it's just about you know getting your, keeping your head in the right place, that's all. There's no kind of weird trickery to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you're, uh, Lee, you're no um, stranger to long-term projects either. I, I'm actually, I'm thinking about the fall as well. Which is a yes. Let's applaud the fall. Yes, um, but I imagine that maintaining that kind of concentration, perhaps over over time, over months, and out of chronology, is difficult. Well, it's, I mean, it's all about trying to get away from yourself. I, you know, that's the more I do this, the more I kind of find that's act, that's the goal, and it's very hard to do to get the you know the, the your own thoughts out of your head and the character's thoughts into your head. And th there's so many different ways you can go about. I mean, it's wrong to use the word trick yourself to do that, but you have to. Um, put yourself in a position that's beneficial to that, that, that kind of work. And with a character like this, it's, I look so different that you know, I look at myself in the mirror and I behave differently. People treat me differently when I walk on the set. Um, and that's very useful. But it's all, you know, the mask absolutely helps to just separate yourself from who you really are because Lee Pace is pretty boring. <laughs> so you say. But the Elven King is a fascinating, complicated, you know, wild creature. You know, and I, I've got to get uh, scrub as much of me out of, you know, my mind for that moment as, as I can. You know. Do we have another clip? I know we have one more. You cannot go to war. This does not concern you. Excuse me, but just in case you haven't noticed, there is an army of elves out there. Not to mention several hundred angry fishermen. We are, in fact, outnumbered. Not for much longer. What does that mean? It means, Master Baggins. You should never underestimate dwarves. We have reclaimed Erebor. Now, we defend it. I imagine that when you play these parts, so much of it starts with the voice. I mean, you guys, you're doing it, and, and in your case, maybe even learning a new language or lines in a different language. How much of, how much of your, uh, your acting background applies when you, when you take on a fantasy role like this? I mean, does it start there? I remember being ridiculed about my obsession with the voice, Lee Pace. <laughs> Like how, <laughs> please, come on, let's have some details. Um, I kind of do, I do take that side of it quite seriously because um, there was a long period of time, again, to, to kind of be consistent with the voice. And it, it started for me because I was trying to age the character a bit. I felt like I was too young to play the character. So I dropped his voice by about two semitones and, and I had to do 
a fair amount of work to, to make that happen, and your voice finds its way back to where it, where it wants to be. It's quite, it was quite tricky in, in ADR post-production coming back and not being able to do the voice again. Um, so I had to do lots of screaming and shouting to, to sort of break my voice a bit. But um, I just wanted him to sound like the kind of uh, character that could command an army over a battlefield. It's a, it's a specific sound that I was looking for, that's all. Like a ravaged, ruined kind of voice. I, gotta I wasn't ridiculing you. That's what, that's what elves and dwarves do. <laughs> <laughs> they fight. I imagine that this taking roles like this isn't like taking a role in any movie. These movies are, are huge events, and th it, must, it must have changed your lives in some way. I mean, how, 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 have, how has being in The Hobbit made things different for you guys? Well, I mean, I'll say um, I, um, I was shocked when Peter Jackson cast me. <laughs> you know, I really, I really, I mean, I really wanted to, you know, to do it. I wanted to be a part of it. But when I actually got the call that he wanted me to be a part of it, I was like, oh, wow, okay. Um, so now that we've come on the other side of it, and it has been a tremendous amount of work um, and very creative work, and um, I feel good about the work. I know that he feels good about the work. Um, yeah, I definitely feel... Uh, kind of a confidence in that creative process, process. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, like you can, yeah, we can all get together. I mean, most of this movie we made around Philippa Boyan's kitchen table. Like, discussing the characters, discussing, you know, what the stakes are of the scene, discussing things that we like about the story, all these, all, you know. Um, Sounds very intimate. Yeah, we, we're friends at this point, you know. And that's, that's been a very, you know, big growing process for me. I mean, it's been four years I've been working on this, knowing them. Are you, are you sad that it's over? It's not quite over until the extended edition DVD release. <laughs> That's right. Yes. And boy, that is going to be a long movie. <laughs> yes. Yeah, one of the things that I, in answer to your question, that has changed for me is just an understanding of the global reach of this story. And it's not just the film, it's the fact that this book has been translated into so many languages because it translates culturally. And that, to me, is really exciting because even if you don't really see it in its original format language-wise, you can still get something from it. And I think war uh, and the understanding of it and the sense of leaving home and going home translates into any culture, and that, to me, is really exciting. It does feel universal, and, I, and it has that appeal. I know that we have some time for a few questions from the audience. I've also got some questions from Twitter that are coming in. Let's keep the questions just to this film, please, or the trilogy. Hi. Um, of all three movies, which scene was the most emotional scene for you to film and why? If you can tell us. I can definitely answer that one. It's the, the one scene that we probably can't talk about because it's, it will spoil the story, but... Um, it was the what it's the scene that you know is coming the minute you are offered the job um, And it's the scene that you read in the book It was the words were very very close to Tolkien and when playing it it was There was no acting it was it just felt like speaking the truth and uh, Two actors connecting so yeah, I was I was definitely in Here's here's another question uh, he's, He doesn't want to say it's the last scene with Legolas. You'll, you'll see. You'll see. <laughs> it's a great scene. I know the one. This is one from Twitter user Cloud Jetlop. He uh, asks, "Did you guys take a prop home with you as a souvenir?" I'm curious to know why that question is the most asked question <laughs> about Everyone this. Everyone wants what to know. It? Do you have a sword? Have something? Um, yeah, I took my sword home, and I took my I took a set of my ears home, and I. <laughs> I've, I folded Probably them in a, a copy of, of the... Yeah. yeah, every day you get a new set of ears, and on the last day I kept the ears, and I, I folded them in my copy of The Hobbit and kind of put them on the shelf. So one day I'll open it up, and they'll be like... <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> Didn't take anything back? I was offered the hands and flatly refused. It's <laughs> the, the most ugly thing I've ever seen, and they were the bane of my life. Try going to the bathroom with a pair of big prosthetic hands on. It's the most disappointing thing in life. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Let's have, a, let's have a third question. Hi. I'm excited for this movie, actually. Really, really, really excited. B big Hobbit fan. Uh, how, how, did, how did the filmmakers go about animating Smog, the dragon? 
Well, I mean, that, that's really a question for Peter, um, not me. But I do remember when we were doing, when I was in New Zealand for the first time, and I was like looking for, you know, I was like, what's the dragon going to be? Like, what's it going to be? What's it going to look like? Um, and he was like, it's going to be big. <laughs> and I said, like, it's going to be big. And he's like, it's going to be really, really big. <laughs> um, and I, but I, love, I love how much the dragon actually re- resembles Tolkien's picture of the dragon. You know, the, 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 the drawing on the book, you know? I don't know how they did it. If I say the word Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, yeah, I got, I was really lucky because there was a moment in uh, the, the third film where um, they wanted me to s- sort of replicate Smaug a little bit in one scene. So Benedict was down in New Zealand um, voicing him. And so I went in to watch and to do some dialogue opposite him. and. and there was, they were filming him because he was physicalizing uh, on all fours. He was kind of creating this, this body to go with the voice. And it was, it was so fascinating because I don't even know if it's made it into the animation, but all the animators were there and they watched him. So I think that's one of the reasons why the, the dragon's also successful. It's really based on his physicality. This is a, actually, this is a really neat question um, uh, from, from a, a Twitter uh, feed, actually. Um, this is from a Twitter user named Matthias Fatmatias. Outside of the filming itself, what was the most memorable thing that you guys did in New Zealand or took away from New Zealand? Uh, I, I went on a couple of really great hikes. I mean, if you get the chance to go to New Zealand, jump at it because it is an awesome, extraordinary place. I hiked around um, the Tongariro Northern Circuit, which is um, kind of up near where they filmed Mount Doom. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it was about three day hike all the way around it. I, I did another three day hike around a, a place called Lake Wakia Moana, which is pretty fun. And you kind of camped along the way. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, I set myself a challenge to try and ski down every slope that New Zealand had to offer. And I think I managed it actually. <laughs> um, I remember going back early after, before the second block, two weeks early to ski on my birthday. So um, I did, that was my thing. It's such a beautiful place. It's hard to believe you, it, it, it's not a fantasy itself. Let's, let's have another question from the crowd. Oh, oh hi, Lee. Hi, Richard. Uh, I was wondering, was there something about both of your characters that made you really want the role like, to like, have it, like to play it? That is a really good question. Um, well, I remember uh, I, um, Philippa Boyne's gotten the phone with me when they were kind of like, we think you'd be really right for this part and we'd like to meet with you and talk to you about it. And she got on the phone with me. I remember being up in the country, walking around the woods and kind of her explaining to me how she saw the Elven King, that he's very old, that he's, that he's isolated from these wars, that he's, you know, and we just kind of started batting around who the character could be. Because like I said in the book, it's, it's not you know, very well defined. It's a book is this big, the movie's that big. You know what I mean? So we had a lot of work to do and that's what really excited me about it is filling in those gaps and letting it be a creative, you know, creation with it. You know, the book, me, remember that cartoon, the cartoon of the Hobbit that's made? Very different Elven Kings. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the scene actually that uh, they, they gave me to read for the audition. Sometimes they create scenes just for audition purposes, which I thought this scene was. And it's the scene in the first movie where Balin and Thorin talk in the corridor about, you know, the quest. And I assumed it wouldn't be in the film, but they they liked it so much that they, you know, kept it in. Um, but that scene for me really encompassed everything about the character. And it's it's unusual to to find all the seeds of the character in one scene. So that was, you know, the audition scene was the reason I wanted to play him. Here's another question from Twitter. Emily, uh, Emily Lowther asks, uh, actually, this is a two-part question. First, what was your last day on set like? Um, I can imagine, especially after four years, just the, the emotion of being in Middle Earth, maybe for that last moment. How, how would that feel? And, and also, have you guys seen the movie yet? Yeah, I've seen it four times. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I saw it on IMAX when I was in Toronto, and it is the, the only way to see it. It is extraordinary on IMAX to see how, you know, the big scope of the movie. You get part one. Okay. Uh, what was part one? Oh, um, I think it, it feels like it's the bane of my life that I always 
am the last man standing on every job I've ever done. There's always water and I'm always, everyone's gone home. Um, they all kind of get wrapped out and I was still fighting <laughs> the, the, uh, the final fight with Thorin and Azog. And my last scene was a scene in the story where Thorin has to make a decision about how his story will end. Um, and it, I knew that it was my last shot because people gather and Fran came to set and Philippa came to set and it was a very emotional moment. Uh, I'll never forget it. Hi, my name is Shay. My question is for both Lee and Richard. Um, can you describe your choice and how difficult it was to take either your own take as actors on these characters, or did you pull it directly from the novel and try to stay true to Tolkien's image? Well, the, the, um, the book is a different thing than the movie. They're just different. They're different things. The experience of reading the book is, you know, one author's writing going into your mind and your imagination and his imagination, having a very private conversation. This movie is a very collaborative experience. I mean, it's not just me making the character, but, you know, the costume designer, uh, Peter King, who did the makeup and hair, all of the, the CGI creators who kind of not only create my elven halls, but create the Battle of Five Armies. So... And then Peter Jackson, and you know, so there's so it's a it's a collaborative thing making a movie, and it and it is creative, and Tolkien is one of the creators in that, you know, process, and a very you know powerful one, a very um, potent voice in that discussion, you know, the most potent voice in the discussion, but it is a collaboration. Um, yeah, I feel like I was. I feel like my imagination has perhaps been created by a writer like Tolkien because I read him so avidly as a kid. I was seven when I first read the book. Um, and actually when I was cast, I really it's, the, it's one of the first roles where I felt like I'm not right for this part. And I went to New Zealand really thinking I've got to shift so far to get to the character. But the one thing that I did have was the book and my first impressions of the character. So I would always try and go back to the book despite how wrong I felt that I was. I'd always think, well, you know, Pete's entrusted me with the role. I've got my interpretation of the character and they've got to meet somewhere in the middle and, and that's the experiment that, that we go on. You know. Is there ever any room for improvisation with it? Oh yeah, the whole thing. I mean, there's so much, there's so much kind but of no, experimentation. I mean... The scene uh, in, the thir in the final film where Thorin's kind of going through this change um, with the gold, that whole scene was just one stage direction that said, Thorin sees his reflection and realizes what he's become. And Pete said, I don't know what to do with this. So it was, that whole thing was a very abstract experiment. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had something to add, but I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, but, but, but it, a large part of what we do is Pete is such a fan of these stories and a fan of these movies and a fan of the fans. I'm a fan of these, you know, the movies, a fan of Pete's, a fan of the fans. So, so much of what I'm doing is trying to make Pete laugh or make Pete kind of be like, oh, that's cool. You know, I wanna, that's, that's the Elven King. I don't want to put it in the movie, you know? So there is a certain amount of just kind of trying things, hoping that it will, you know, you know, make Pete go, cool, cool. I like it. Uh, definitely works. Definitely makes us do that. Let's let's thank our both our guests for coming tonight. <laughs> the Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies, opens on out. Wednesday, seventeenth. Go check it out. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>